Well, good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to gather together in person uh, to worship and praise our glorious God in heaven. And so I want to welcome you to Christ Central Presbyterian Church. And um, also, um, hopefully each one of you has a worship bulletin to follow along in our liturgy this morning. Uh, the entire liturgy is printed. Uh, we don't have any hymnals out for you, uh, but all the lyrics to the hymns we'll be singing are in your bulletin. And also, um, I suppose one uh, side benefit of all of us wearing face masks is uh, you don't have to worry about bad breath. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, other than that, um, all of our church activities continue to be suspended through May the 31st. Uh, worship, this is the only in-person activity we're doing at this point, uh, though uh, we do have some online offerings of uh, various things. If you are interested in participating in those, you can um, contact uh, the church office uh, by phone or by email. And other than that... Um, I believe that's all the announcements that we have, um, so I'd ask if you would stand for our call to worship this morning. This is a responsive reading coming from Psalm 95, and so God's word calls us to worship. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. And if you join with us as we glorify God singing the hymn, O oh, Worship the King. Worship oh, 
But Father, we gather uh, together once again in person to sing for joy, to praise your name. And you are our great King, all glorious above. We are in awe of your greatness and your power, majesty and splendor. Father, you are the rock of our salvation. And being mindful of those who are following along with this liturgy at home, we ask that you would remove distractions from us, that you would fill us with your spirit. We ask that you would draw near to us and receive our worship as pleasing in your sight. For we approach you through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. You are one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, following along in your bulletins, if you profess faith in Jesus Christ, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the officials of Judah, with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon, the Lord showed me. Behold, two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs. And the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten due to rottenness. Then the Lord said to me, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good, and the bad figs, very bad, which cannot be eaten due to rottenness. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Like these good figs, so I will regard as good the captives of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans, for I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them up and not overthrow them. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord. And they will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with their whole heart. This is the word of the Lord. Come now to a time of confessional sin. Uh, let's bow our heads as we look to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, we do live in such a polarizing environment. There are many views concerning this novel coronavirus. And the view that any particular person has is often in the form of strongly held convictions. Father, some operate out of fear, 
uh, being looked down upon by others as needlessly overreacting, giving into all the hype. Some operate out of impatience and overconfidence, being looked down upon by others as reckless and careless. Father, most are somewhere in the middle. Nevertheless, deep down at the heart of it, Father, we are all selfish and unloving. Rather than considering others as better than ourselves, we assert our own will and our own interests. Father, we acknowledge that it is difficult to sacrifice our desires out of love for others. It is difficult to maintain a spirit of unity. So, Father, we ask, may this not be an issue that brings division. And so, in your mercy, would you help us to see our sin? Would you give us broken and contrite hearts to confess and repent of our sin? And in this brief moment of silence, would you receive our silent prayers of confession? And Father, would you hear us as we all pray together? Gracious Father, I'm not worthy of blessings and mercies. My depraved nature reveals itself in disobedience and rebellion. I am often discontented, prideful, envious, and revengeful. As I have confessed my guilt, help me to feel it deeply, to hate my sin, Yet to remember there is hope in you. Help me to see the lamb that takes away sin. Through him may I return to you, listen to you, trust in you, delight in your law, obey you, and be upheld by you. For your glory and the good of my fellow man. Amen. Our assurance of pardon this morning comes from 1 John Chapter 1, verse 9, we're given the great promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from uh, the book of Colossians, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 11. And the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you lay aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, 
barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather once again as the visible body of Christ on earth and we can worship you corporately, seek your face and find strength for the coming week. Father, we do pray for our world, our nation, our state and our city. We ask, Lord, that you would sustain us during these days of the pandemic that, Father, you would bring a swift and complete closure to this. And that, Lord, you would heal bodies, heal lives, heal our economy around the globe. and Help us, Lord, to get back to a sense of normal. And, Father, in so doing, I pray that we would be more grateful than ever before. And that we would acknowledge more than ever before your many, many kindnesses to us as we're so undeserving. We praise you that we've been brought into the family of God. We praise you that your love and your care is fixed upon us. And that, Lord, our best interests are always in your mind in all the things that you do. Father, we pray this morning for those who struggle with illness. We continue to pray for healing in Brian Waugh. We pray for Mercedes Kirk and Ron Quick Sr., we pray for Judy Smith and Alan Dostal, for Frank and Connie Frail and St. Claude McDonald. Father, we also remember Pat Barton, the loss of her husband, Dave. Lord, we would ask and pray that your spirit would be upon her now and that, Lord, you would give her grace as she seeks to make transition to North Carolina. Father, be with her in all the details. Be with her daughters and their families as they make so many decisions. Father, we pray for those who are confined this morning, Mike Cawley and Augustina Livesey, Ron Quick Jr. and Lee Zambon. We also pray for others, Lord, who have needs. We think of Evelyn Jackson, Stephen Hunt, Stephanie Keister, Becky Yu, Kathy Huffman, Stuart Hickerson, Bruno Gravanti, Lana Schwartz, Laura Cameron, Lenore Ball, and Orville and Trudy Bergen. Father, be with all these and all of their needs as you define them. We pray that your hand would be in their lives and that they would sense our love and the power offered by prayer on their behalf. We pray for our missionaries, Lord. We ask that you would be with Don and Leah Vanderplug. We pray for Rodney and Jana Davila, Dave and Paige Hawes, for Andrew Newman, we pray for SIATN and B. Kirk. Father, be with all of these in their ministries. We pray that you would multiply them. Father, we also pray that you would continue to assist us in our efforts to establish a Spanish work inside of our church. Father, breathe in these things about. We pray that your kingdom would come and that your will will be done. And that, Lord, we would be servants of you. I pray, Lord, as a pastor this morning, that you would bless every one of us with your presence. Lord, that you would comfort us if we have fears. That you would encourage us if we have anxiety. Lord, you would heal us for dealing with illness of any kind. Lord, be with your people. And fortify us and strengthen us for the week ahead now. We ask all these things confidently in the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray many years ago, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our third scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, 
verses 25 through 34. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I invite you to stand as we sing our next hymn, uh, Jesus, Thou Joy of Loving Hearts. Father, we indeed are grateful for your mercies. You loved us when we did not love you. You sought us out when we were not seeking you. You opened our eyes to see the depth of our sin and misery, and you gave us our Savior Jesus, who cleanses us from our sin. 
So as those whose life is hidden with Christ in God, as those who will be revealed with him in glory, how could we not also give you our whole tithe? So at the end of this service, with joy and love for you, we bring to you our tithes and our offerings. We ask that you would use these gifts for your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And if you would remain standing for the singing of the doxology. have your Bibles, you can open with me to the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians. We've been in a series of messages through this brief but very powerful epistle, the book of Colossians. For several weeks now, we find ourselves in the middle of the book, beginning with chapter 3. The first two chapters of the book are highly theological. Paul is giving a foundation uh, for the Colossians to understand uh, the power and the detrimental effects of false teachers within the Colossian church, or having influence in the Colossian church. And now he turns more to a practical application of all that he's taught in the first two chapters. Chapters three and four are highly practical as the Apostle Paul turns away from the false teaching and he turns toward what it looks like for believers in Christ, for Christians, to live out their faith as new creatures in contrast to so much of what the false teachers taught. There are four stages I'd like you to notice with me this morning, four stages in this development uh, as Paul begins to outline our growth in Christ Jesus. The first is our identification, our identification with Christ. And we'll look at that in verses 1, 3, and 4. And then secondly, our concentration upon Christ, our concentration upon Christ. And that's in verses 1b and 2. And then thirdly, our mortification of sin in verses 5 through 9a. And then finally, our transformation to the new self in verses 9b through 11. And so those are your key words, identification, concentration, mortification, and transformation. And with an outline of the message, join me in prayer. Let's ask God to bless our time of study together. Heavenly Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Lord, we know that, as Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. So, Lord, we beg you that your Holy Spirit would accompany your word and that you would speak to our hearts of deep and eternal things so that we might know you better and for some of us to know you for the first time. Lord, do all these things and more. We'll give you the praise and glory for what you will do in our lives and in our church body. And we make our prayer confidently in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, notice with me our identification in Christ. And we see this in the first uh, three verses. Uh, Paul makes mention first of three great events in the life of Jesus Christ. Three great events which secured our salvation. You'll notice in verse 1a, he speaks of resurrection. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, his resurrection allows us to live a new life with power. And then Paul speaks of his crucifixion. Look at verse 3. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's an indirect reference to the crucifixion of Jesus. And his crucifixion has secured our atonement, our atonement before the Father. 
And then thirdly, his return or his second coming. Look at verse four. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed in him, with him in glory. This is a great hope that we have as believers, that we live in a life and a world that is affected by sin. We live in bodies that are constantly dealing with our sin. And yet, the day of revelation will come. Jesus Christ is going to come again. And at that revelation, at that second coming, the sons and the daughters of God will be disclosed, will take place in glory, for it will involve the sharing of Christ's likeness and the receiving of the glorious resurrection body. We may not feel very glorious right now, but the Bible makes it clear that even as we live in this life and in this world and in this body that is affected by sin, one day we're going to lay that aside. And we're going to receive, just like Christ, a new heavenly eternal body. And we'll be forever with him. And so we have these three great events, the resurrection, the crucifixion, and the return or the second coming of Christ. Now, notice secondly that Paul speaks of our identification or union with Christ in the context of all three of these events. Look at verse 1. You have been raised up with Christ. Verse 3. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ. In verse 4, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Notice those three yous. We have a union with Christ that goes far beyond human comprehension. That we are part of the visible body of Christ. And we share in his actual life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's one of the most difficult things to learn as a Christian. It's not really about us living and imitating Christ. We do that and we should. But the power of that is Christ in us. Christ lives inside of every one of us as believers. His spirit lives inside of us. And his spirit animates us and enables us to put to death the deeds of the flesh, the deeds of the body, and to live a life in obedience to Christ's commands. But this identification with Christ, this union with Christ, is so important and so heavily taught in the New Testament. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Paul says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. There's something that has taken place inside of us as we identify. When we embrace Christ, we identify with him deeply inside of our hearts. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. You know, there are cultures where people walk around and they beat themselves on the back and they try to do bodily harm as if to make atonement for their sins. But Paul's already made that clear in Colossians 1 and 2 that that sort of thing, that kind of harsh treatment of the body will never make atonement for sins. No, the way that we participate with Christ is we look at the deed of his cross. That he died in our place. He died as a sin-bearing substitute. And by faith, we trust him as the payment for our sins. We trust his righteousness. That's why the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. You could do all kinds of things to try to pay for your sins, but you'll never be pleasing to God. Because his son, Jesus Christ, is the only one who could make atonement for sins. And therefore, the only thing that makes God happy at that point is our faith and trust in Christ alone. That brings glory to the Father when we trust in the Son exclusively. Well, that is our identification with Christ. Now, I want you to notice there's something practical here, our concentration upon Christ. What should this identification lead to? Whenever we become sons and daughters of God, whenever we're converted and brought into the family of God, 
It should lead to a concentration upon Christ. And this is sprinkled in the midst of the first four verses. Look at verse 1b. Since you're raised with Christ, what? Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now look at verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. You see, if I have identified with Christ, if I've trusted him as my Lord and Savior, then that of necessity is going to lead toward concentration on Christ every day. A lifelong of what John R.W. Stott calls aspiration. What do I aspire to? I aspire to know God better. And as believers, we've been brought into the family of God. We make up the body of Christ on earth. We enjoy a rich, deep union and communion with Christ and each other. And Paul wants us to concentrate, to meditate on these things. Now, what are these things? Things above. Well, they're not material items. But they are the realities in connection to Christ's sovereign reign over the universe as he fills the universe with his power. They include his character, his presence, and his heavenly joys. In other words, the more that I pursue Christ, the more that I long for him and hunger after him, the more he fills me. It's the one thirst, ladies and gentlemen, that can be fully quenched and yet is always present. We thirst for so many things in life, but our hearts, as St. Augustine said, they're restless until we find our rest in thee. And that restlessness will be filled with Christ himself. We're not to be seeking after heavenly geography. We're not to be seeking after material things in heaven, but the one who dwells there. That's why the Bible says more than many other things, seek after God. Seek his face continually. That's why David said in one of the Psalms, this is one thing I will aspire to, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his presence. The more we focus upon the Lord himself and make that a chief goal in life, the more we'll maintain our focus on Christ. Our minds must be centered on the heavenly realm where Christ rules. This is the true and eternal home. And ladies and gentlemen, the language suggests a continuous, ongoing effort. Keep on setting your minds and hearts for such a focus. It doesn't come automatically. Even as I mentioned before in John 15, Jesus said, abide in me. Let my word abide in you. And I think as Americans, we hear that word abide and we think of a hammock on a summer day. We're just laying there by ourselves and putting forth no effort whatsoever, just soaking up. A beautiful summer day, perhaps in the shade. No, abide is a vigorous term in the New Testament. It means to press in. It's an energetic term. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Keep on setting your minds and hearts on such a focus. It doesn't happen automatically. Why? Because of the sin that remains in our fleshly body. It also involves a regular assessment concerning my ambitions and lifestyle. Are these consistent with the ultimate goal, conformity to Christ? The realm above is to be sought diligently and in contrast to any of the faults seeking of the heavenly experiences by the promoters of the Colossian philosophy. You remember that? We studied that a few weeks ago, how some of the Colossians said, you know, I worship with the angels. I mean, I'm so spiritual that when I get with God alone, I feel the dew of heaven on my forehead. And what they were doing is simply setting themselves, setting themselves aside as special, as unique, as ultra-spiritual, way beyond anybody else. And that's what proud people do. That's what insecure people do. They step on others to build themselves up. And Paul is saying, none of that is needed. You don't need to share in somebody else's experience. All the treasures that God can offer you are available in your union with Christ. Keep 
seeking. Seeking after and communing with Christ is the priority of life. That's why we read that section in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says, don't worry about all these other things. You know, don't worry then saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear for clothing? I think the majority of Americans go through life with those kind of anxieties. What shall we drive? Where shall we go to school? Who shall we marry? He says, the Gentiles seek after all these things, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Christ will fulfill all the needs of your life. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to give you everything that maybe your or my sinful desire wants, but he's going to give you what you need to be absolutely content. And what we need more than anything else, ladies and gentlemen, is not tangible. It's that relationship with Christ. That's what brings security. That's what brings peace. That's what brings the power to deal with our sin. We seek after the Lord because he seeks after us first. Did you notice that when Danny read Jeremiah 24? He talked about good figs and bad figs. And the Lord went on to talk about how he sent his own people away in exile. And yet in verse 6 he says, I will set my eyes on them for good. I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart that I am the Lord, a heart to know me, that they shall be my people and I will be their God and they shall return to me with their whole hearts. You can't muster that up. You can fake it. But you see, the only reason we ever seek after God is because he seeks after us first. Jesus made that plain. He says, no one can come to the Father or no one can come to me, says Jesus, Unless the Father draws him. Unless the Father draws him. And so we're commanded to seek after, to concentrate our minds and our hearts on Christ. And this means forgetting the past, a good bit of it. Sometimes we have to forgive others, sometimes we have to be forgiven. That's why Paul said, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the mark of the calling of God, the high calling of God, in Christ Jesus. You've got to lay some things aside. Well, he speaks of our identification with Christ and then our concentration on Christ and then the bulk of the passage in dealing with our mortification of sin in verses 5 through 9a. Now, you'll notice Paul has urged us to be somewhat heavenly minded. Set your minds on things above. A lot of times we hear that statement, You're, or he is so heavily minded, he's of no earthly good. But that's really not the case. Because this heavenly mindedness, this focus, this fixation on Christ should lead to a practical, concrete impact in daily life. What kind of impact is this? On earth, it involves obedience. If I'm concentrating on Christ, if I see myself identified with his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his second coming, if I have a union with him and communion with him daily, then it's going to be demonstrated by a life of obedience in general and mortification of the deeds of the flesh in particular, putting our sin to death. In fact, this whole section from verse 5 to chapter 4, verse 6 flows out of verses 1 through 4. If I identify with Christ and I'm meeting with him regularly, then he is going to give me the power and the strength to deal with my sin. And the warfare between the flesh and spirit continues until the last day. And Paul urges us to press on as we long for the final adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So in light of our relationship to Christ, our identification with him, our union with him, Paul says, consider the members of our earthly body as dead to sin. Now, let me explain that just a little bit. We have died to sin's penalty. We do that through identification with Christ. We identify with him in his crucifixion on the cross. We put our faith in him. But we die to sin's power by imitation of Christ. 
Identification, imitation. If I am meeting with Christ on a regular basis, then I am going to study his life and the way that he conducts himself as the eternal son of God. And then by identifying with him, my sin is paid for. The penalty is over with. I am crucified with Christ. And yet I'm also called to crucify the flesh daily, to take up my cross and follow Christ. The New Testament speaks of our death to sin and holiness in two ways. One is unique and unrepeatable. I've been crucified with Christ. But the second one is constant. And throughout life, I imitate Christ by taking up my cross and following him to crucifixion. And we do this by faith once again. We don't do it in our own strength. That's why Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And we do it with the means of grace, ladies and gentlemen. You know, in Ephesians 6, 17, Paul talks about uh, many things about the spiritual armor of God. Well, the Spirit's weapon is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There are many Christians who say, I want to live a powerful life. I want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. But they never read God's Word. God's Word is not saturating their minds and their hearts. That is a means of grace. A lot of times they don't even bother to come to church. They don't bother to fellowship with other Christians. They don't bother to worship. Listen, the spirit of God is inextricably bound to the word of God and to the means of grace, the other means of grace, like the sacraments, prayer, and all those things that we learn to do in the body of Christ. 1 John 2, 14 makes it clear we're enabled to overcome the evil one, Satan, when the word of God abides in us. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. It's really a contradiction to talk about fighting my flesh and fighting my sin and avoiding the word of God. No, the spirit of God works through the word of God. And there are many people that claim to have the Spirit of God, but have little to no connection with the Word of God when it comes to obedience to Christ. Paul says in Romans 8, 13, if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if you, by the Spirit, are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so Paul tells us to mortify, to put to death these deeds. Now look at verse 5. He begins to give some examples of particular sins. First of all, immorality translates the word pornea and refers to any form of sexual sin from uh, pornography to adultery to fornication. Then he mentions impurity, meaning filthiness or uncleanness. We might say this would point to perverted forms of sex like homosexuality. He mentions many other places in the Bible where God says this is wrong. It's a sin. We love the sinners, but we hate the sin. God hates it. So we want to be gentle at that point. But there is immorality, there is impurity. It's a more general term. It goes beyond the actual act to the evil thoughts and intentions of the mind. Remember Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. So we need to be mindful of that. He goes on, passion and evil desire. 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, Paul comments and says, Christians don't live in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. Such behavior is completely inappropriate for believers. Some people are led and controlled by their passions. Passions for a substance, passion for an experience. You know, the Bible talks about passion rotting the bones because there's really only one holy passion and that is towards Christ and knowing him. And that leads to a balanced passion for everything else. He goes on to talk about greed. You know, money mentioned in the New Testament is one of the major ways, one of the major things that keeps people out of the kingdom. It is so, so subtle. And it leads to that sense of greed. And Paul mentions greed or covetousness. It's also mentioned in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, covetousness is the last commandment. And it comes from the Greek word, two Greek words, pleon, meaning more, 
and exos to have. I want more. It is the insatiable desire to have more for all the wrong reasons. You know, James says that in James chapter 4. What is the source of fights and quarrels amongst you? Is it not your lust, your pleasures, which are waging war in your members? I have to ask that question. When I want something so badly that I see it turning into idolatry, something becomes so important for me, there's something seriously wrong at that point. That's why people that make gobs of money a lot of times get more and more fearful of losing it. Because the money is taking control of them. And they're no longer handling it. When he goes on, look at verses 8 and 9a. More examples of particular sins. Anger and wrath. I listened to a great message with Diane last night about anger from Tim Keller up in New York City preached it many years ago, but he made some very good points about anger and why we get angry, because we're protecting something. And that God gets angry, but it's a balanced anger. He's slow to anger. It's never a no anger, and it's not an out of control anger, wrath, but it's a slow anger. He's slow to anger. It was a very convicting message. But so often we can get angry and we can get upset and mad for all the wrong reasons because we're protecting something. We're concealing something. Or we're lusting after something that we really want bad and we don't want anybody to get in the way of it. Malice and slander. You know, we can wish ill on people. Some people are that way. You know, something bad happens in somebody's life and it's like, well, I saw that coming. I knew that was going to happen. Yep. There's no sense of concern. There's no sense of weeping with those who weep. It's just an attitude of pride and arrogance. But you saw it coming. That's malice. It's wishing evil upon people. Slander. Saying ugly, cutting things to somebody else. Abusive speech. You know, some people have a mouth like a sewer. And whenever we are talking with filthy, profane, and vulgar language, all we're revealing, according to Jesus, is what's down in the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Very important. Lying. Satan lied in deceiving Adam and Eve. That's part of Satan's nature. God hates lies, according to Proverbs. If you go through your Bible, you'll see lie after lie after lie after lie. Even amongst God's people. Cain lied to God after murdering Abel. Abraham lied, claiming Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. Sarah lied to the three angelic visitors regarding whether or not she laughed. Isaac lied by denying that Rebecca was his wife. Rebecca lied in her conspiracy to defraud Esau of his birthright. Lying characterizes Satan. John 8, 44, Jesus said, he is the father of lies. And so believers are called to something different. That is truth, according to Titus 1, 2. And when a believer lies, they're imitating Satan, not their heavenly father. The believer has died in the sense of paying sin's penalty and been united to Christ in his death. And so Paul says, put this off. And remember, the reason that we have all these sins, we don't spend so much time on each individual sin. Most of us know what anger and wrath is. We know what malice is and lying and abusive speech. All of this stuff comes from a lack of attention to verses one through four. I'm not focused on Christ. I may not be fully identified with him. Is he present in my life? What does my daily life look like? Am I reading my Bible and I waking up in the morning and the first thing I think of is God, I wanna meet with you. I wanna have an encounter with you. I want you to change my heart and help me today to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Every one of us needs that. All those lies I just mentioned, that's just the book of Genesis. You go through the rest of your Bible, you'll still see lies because our hearts are sinful, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't believe that, read Genesis 6, 5. When God saw right before the flood the evil of man. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You ought to camp out on that verse sometime. 
If you're worried about one particular sin in your life, you know, some people think, if I just get that one thing under control, everything else will be okay. That's not the grace of God. That'd be like me trying to enter a golf tournament, you know? And I've got to play 18 holes, let's say at Augusta National in Georgia. And all I do is I go to the 14th hole and I putt, and I putt. And I finally get my putting game down on the 14th hole, not realizing that there's so much more to playing a good round of golf, like driving, and like being able to hit a sand wedge or a pitching wedge, and getting up on the green, and not over the green, and doing that on 18 holes. Sometimes we look at our lives and we isolate one particular sin, and yet the Bible says every intent of the thoughts of his heart is only evil continually. Why is the Bible so negative at that point about your nature and mine? to force us to desperation so that we stop trusting in ourselves and we stop trying to manage even ourselves and our sin and we take hold of Christ as our only hope and we identify with him and then by the power of the spirit of God in our lives we begin to imitate and take up our cross joyfully and follow him. And there is contentment in our lives. And there is peace instead of anger and wrath. There is love and tears instead of malice and slander. And there is truth and coming into the light instead of abusive speech and lying. All these things begin to be mortified when we take care of the one thing and follow after Christ. Well, that is our mortification of sin. And finally, quickly, a transformation, our new self. This is really the key to all of this. Look at verses 9b through 11. Since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Paul speaks here of the self. You know, there's a death to sin, as we talked about when we identify with Christ. There's a death to self when we imitate Christ throughout life. We've been crucified with Christ, and yet we're called to crucify the self daily. And we come to this passage, and Paul talks about the old self and the new self. If the old self is dead, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, then why do we still sin? Because the new self lives in the old body and must contend with the flesh. Paul shows this conflict in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. He makes it clear that sin is not in the inner man. When he talks about, I desire what is holy and good. I want to obey the word of God. But the flesh in that passage does not mean the body in and of itself, but it does mean the body that is dominated by sin. It means the body that is affected by sin and evil. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way, the body as sin dwells in it during this earthly life. And the flesh includes all sinful desires, drives and passions associated with our humanness. The presence of the unredeemed flesh causes us to groan within ourselves, according to Romans 8.23, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of the body. And once again, we're confronted with the importance of our minds, what we think about, what we focus on. We're being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. That's why Paul said in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And when our minds are changed, and we're reading the word of God and the spirit of God is activating that word inside of us. Not only in regeneration, but in our sanctification. We can mortify the flesh. We become new creatures. We lay aside the old self. And we put on the new self. And notice it's both private and corporate. I love the picture here. He says, you've laid aside the old self and you put on the new self. You know, I love Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It really uh, 
brings to light what Paul is talking about in Romans 7. But you can't follow the analogy all the way. You remember Dr. Jekyll was the respected doctor. And Mr. Hyde was his alter ego. And he would experiment scientifically until the dark side, Mr. Hyde, came up. Well, the Christian life says it this way. Stop experimenting with the old self. Put him to death. And Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Mr. Hyde is finally found dead in the clothing of Dr. Jekyll and the case is solved as to who he really was. What Christianity does is the reversal of that. It says, yes, you begin, but you're putting Mr. Hyde away and you're not experimenting with him anymore. Isn't that what we do when we sin? That's what young people want to do. They experiment. Experiment. And they allow Mr. Hyde to live. And one or the other is going to win out. In the Christian's life, Dr. Jekyll will. And Mr. Hyde will be fully and finally put to death. But notice Paul says it's not just individual, it's also corporate. Look at verse 11. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, the haves and the have-nots. Paul is saying that this inward transformation is shown corporately in Christ's church. Men and women of completely different origins gathered together in unity, the unity of Christ, sharing a common allegiance to the Lord. And Christ is all that matters. He lives in all the members of the body, regardless of race, class, background, giving them life and power. You know, we hear these days so much about racial and gender and cultural inequality. And we're led to believe that the right political power and money will offer the solutions and somehow get rid of these inequalities and right every wrong. But we know that's not going to happen because of man's sinfulness. The idea of forcing our neighbor to love others and to fight for social justice by taxing him or her more or telling him or her it is the right thing to do is a fantasy. Man doesn't do that. We have enough evidence of that in our culture right now. No, man's heart has to be changed. And that's why the disciples were said of in Acts, I forgot which chapter, they were turning the world upside down. Not by political power or taxation, but by the fact that the Spirit of God was working in their lives and changing the hearts of all those they came in contact with as they acknowledged their sin and their need for a Savior. Are you turning away from the old man and demonstrating the new man or the new self. I read that about uh, butterflies just the other day, the metamorphosis. I hadn't studied that since seventh grade, I think. But how the four stages go through. You have this, this egg and it turns into a larva and then it turns into a pupa and then the adults. And they said that third stage, when they're in the little chrysalis, there's a lot of goo, there's silk, there's agonizing going on, the longest stage. It's not pretty. Sometimes it's hidden. But out of that, this beautiful creature emerges. From an egg to a caterpillar to a magnificent butterfly. That's transformation. And that's exactly what Christ is doing in you. But that third stage is often ugly and it's long and painful. And we need to remember that as we love one another. The sanctification, putting away sin is difficult and it looks different in every single life. Let's be gentle with one another and yet firm. Let's be balanced like Jesus was and let's look to ourselves first and foremost to ask, have I identified with Christ? Am I concentrating on Christ? Am I mortifying my sin? Am I being transformed into a new self and laying Mr. Hyde aside. None of that begins without a personal relationship to Jesus Christ by faith. And that happens in our souls when we see our sin and cry out in desperation and say, Lord, I can't do anything about this. Save me and then sanctify me. Give me the strength and the power to live for you for the rest of my life. Let's pray together.
Father, we thank you for these words of the Apostle Paul, your words. And Father, I pray today that you would take away all imperfections and that you would use the foolishness of the message preached to save those who are lost and to disciple those who are saved. Lord, move us one step closer to you. It will give you praise and glory for all that you will do in every one of our lives individually and in our church corporately. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to our final hymn inside of your bulletin this morning, number 691, It Is Well With My Soul. Let's stand together as we sing.
Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. And as we exit the sanctuary, if you have any tithes or offerings, there will be plates for you to drop those in. And we also ask that you would abide by uh, social distancing practices, as we've all become accustomed to. And uh, try not to congregate in the aisles, but feel free to uh, spend some time uh, enjoying some fellowship with one another in the lobby. But for now, receive the benediction of our Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.